morning, everyone. Welcome to the Council of State Government's eAcademy series. Today's event, 2014 Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, an emphasis on career pathways, is a component of the Leaders Initiative focused on state pathways to prosperity. CSG's president, West Virginia Governor Earl Ray Tomlin, and our chairman, Tennessee Senate Majority Leader Mark Norris, are pledging their tenure to focus on the nexus between workforce development and education, leading to economic growth and prosperity in the state. I'm Pam Bowen, the Director of the Education Policy here at CSG. I want to welcome you and thank you for joining us on this call. Research tells us that by 2022, the United States will lack 11 million workers with post-secondary degrees, certificates, or credentials necessary to meet the job demand. In July, President Obama signed into law the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, which is designed to help individuals seeking employment access the needed education, training, and support services to be successful in the labor market. Additionally, the act will help match business and industry with skilled workers needed to compete in the global economy. Today we're going to talk a little bit about the federal law, its impact on the state, and also explore innovative career pathway programs currently in, in place. A few logistical points for our listeners who are new to CSG's web conferences. Please note that this webinar is being recorded, will be posted to CSG's Knowledge Center shortly after the conclusion of the event. If you're listening over the phone but are not logged into the web portion of this event, please refer to the registration instructions you received. This will help you access the slides that our panelists will be using today. Currently, all participant lines are in listen-only mode. If you have a question for any panelists, you can access the question box. At the bottom right portion of your screen, in the GoToWebinar control panel. Let me introduce our moderator, Tennessee Senate Majority Leader Mark Norris. Senator Norris has served as Tennessee Senate Majority Leader since 2007 and currently <coughs> serves as chair of the Senate Rules Committee and Veterans Affairs Subcommittee. He sits on the Senate Finance, Ways, and Needs Committee, State and Local Government Committee, Calendar Committee, and the Ethics Committee. He's also a member of the Joint Pensions and Insurance Committee. Additionally, Senator Norris is a member of the Tennessee Workforce Development Board. Senator Norris, thank you for serving as our moderator today. I'll turn the control over to you for your introductory comments and introduction of our speaker. Thank you, Pam, and thanks to all of you for being with us this morning. We appreciate the opportunity to share what we've learned, and moving forward, we hope to do it some more. You know, we find ourselves at a at historic crossroads in this country with the reshoring of advanced industries and manufacturing that we all know about, some wonderful grant funding opportunities um, from Washington, and of course, as Pam said, passage of the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act of 2014. There were those of us in the hinterlands who never thought we'd see the reauthorization of the old Workforce Investment Act, but it did come to pass in July. And the confluence of these developments give us a great opportunity um, to sort of seize the moment. We're doing big things in Tennessee. I appreciate those from my home state and my hometown of Memphis who are on board with us today to take advantage of the talent we've assembled through our panelists. And I just want to briefly tell you who those folks are, remind you that there's a link to their full bios. But we're fortunate today uh, to have Robert Kite, Dr. Robert Kite. He is the Director of Adult Services and Workforce System Employment and Training Administration at the U.S. Department of Labor. Uh, he has an extensive background in workforce development and career and technical education, overseeing comprehensive adult employment services and dislocated worker programs that serve as the foundation of the public workforce system, providing necessary support and infrastructure uh, to as many as 2,600 American Job Centers. Next, we'll hear from Lul Testfly, who's Special Assistant, Office of Career, Technical, and Adult Education at the U.S. Department of Education. We've sure had a number of positive visits uh, from Secretary Duncan here in Tennessee. Uh, Lul supports policy and strategy development for the Office of Career, Technical, and Adult Education which is responsible for the U.S. Department of Education's adult education portfolio. Um, this includes corrections and re-entry education, secondary, post-secondary, adult career, and technical 
education as well as community colleges. And last but not least, Alicia Heislop, who is the Director of Public Policy with the Association for Career and Technical Education. Uh, she leads the association's legislative advocacy and research efforts um, that cover both secondary and post-secondary policy issues. She spent more than 15 years in this vineyard working with career and technical education. So we appreciate our panelists' participation, and I will turn it over to you, Pam. Thank you, Senator. I really appreciate your comment. Robert, we are ready for your presentation. We'll start with you. Robert, are you with us this morning? Uh, if you might unmute your phone. Where'd Robert go? Yes, good morning. That would help. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, again, this is Robert Kite from the Department of Labor here in the nation's capital, and I'm glad to be with you this morning and share uh, just some broad insight into the uh, Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act and also provide you with some of the ongoing initiatives uh, here at the Department of Labor to make this an, uh, somewhat of an easy transition from WIA to WIOA. So with that, I'll get started. Uh, in my presentation, I'm going to give you a, a high-level overview of the Act itself and some of the areas that impact states. Uh, we'll look at where we are with the transition to, of, of, from WIA to WIOA and some of the key implementation dates we have. And I'll, my presentation also provides you with some tools and resources that will afford uh, states to access uh, ongoing materials that we're posting on a day-to-day -day basis and you can easily uh, download them for additional information. Uh, the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act, as you know, President uh, Obama signed into law on July 22nd, uh, 2014. It was passed uh, by Congress with a bipartisan majority support uh, in both the Senate and the House of Representatives. Uh, it provides a, a broad vision of workforce programs and it reaffirms the ongoing uh, American job centers remain at the uh, central focus of the public workforce systems. And it also requires much more coordination and alignment of key employment, education, and training programs. The act itself promotes uh, program alignment at the federal, state, and local uh, regional levels. And I will discuss uh, what that means to states uh, a little bit more uh, in detail. Uh, it builds on proven practices such as sector strategies, uh, career pathways, uh, regional economic approaches, and work-based training. In regard to sector strategies, uh, the Act highly promotes that uh, states, locals uh, begin to work much more closely with businesses, looking at economic development, where those in-demand jobs coming from, and focus on bringing those particular industries together to ensure that the uh, public workforce can respond to uh, those future uh, uh, business needs. In regard to career pathways, is a main uh, focus in uh, strategy of how we bring uh, people from all economic stratas on board to ensure that they earn the proper uh, credentials, uh, skill attainments, uh, and, so, and uh, so forth to ensure that they can continue to advance within their careers and at the same time meet those uh, future employment needs of businesses uh, with their regional economic approach is looking at uh, requiring both states and local to look at their economic um, development perspective from a regional approach as opposed to uh, just in their immediate areas and coming together to uh, formulate strategies with that. And work-based training is a major component of uh, the new uh, act as uh, in allowing uh, individuals to uh, gain training 
that will in, allow them to make uh, that successful transition into employment. Uh, the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act is also aligns with the uh, President's vision for a job-driven uh, workforce development, uh, which prepares workers for 21st century jobs and ensure American businesses have skilled workers to be competitive in a global uh, uh, economy. Here at the Department of Labor, the Secretary always says that uh, we're moving away from training and praying and really uh, focusing our, our training dollars and our training on where there's actually a demand uh, for uh, whatever area an individual is trained in. Uh, the act itself aligns with the Vice President's report, the Ready to Work Job Driven Training in American Opportunity, uh, based on his review of the federal job training programs in July 22, 2014. And I provided uh, a link that you can download uh, this report, but this report is really focused on how do we create more alignment among our, our federal agencies that are engaged in, in workforce development. So there's some consistency uh, in what we do. Uh, job training, uh, the job driven training involves three important themes. That's business engagement, uh, strong data usage, and stakeholder collaboration around business engagement. There should definitely be business in the table at the table with us in workforce development as a major partner and how we engage them, we can utilize a number of strategies. Uh, we should make decisions based on data using our local labor market uh, data, looking at future projections from industry uh, as we make our decisions around workforce uh, development. And of course, bringing as many stakeholders uh, to the table as possible and here uh, at Department of Labor, we're, we're joined at the hip with the Department of Education, working very closely with the Department of Health and Human Services, uh, U.S. Department of uh, Agriculture, and, and, and so forth in this work. Uh, I'm going to here um, uh, moving a little bit more towards looking at programs under the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act. Uh, it's designed to supersede the Workforce Investment Act of uh, 1998, and it uh, retains uh, and amends the Education and Family Liter Literacy Act, the wagner Pizer Act, and the Rehabilitation Act of 1973. Some of the core programs remain the same as adult uh, services, dislocated workers, and youth formula grants and the wagner Pizer uh, Employment Services uh, remain at the central point of uh, programs administered here at the Department of Labor. Uh, the, uh, the adult education and literacy programs and vocational rehabilitation state grant programs that assist individuals with disabilities in obtaining uh, employment and administered by the Department of Education. And as I said earlier, uh, throughout this process, we, we, we pretty much all, our staff almost meet on a daily basis between the Department of Labor and the Department of Education as we uh, move to uh, make this transition to uh, align what we're doing, development of policies, and, and so forth, and moving forward. Uh, the Act uh, also continues to authorize Job Corps, Youth Bill, Indian and Native programs, and migrant and se seasonal uh, farm work programs and evaluation and research activities conducted by the uh, Department of Labor. Some highlights here. I won't touch based on all of them, but I'll touch on some of the key that I think are uh, more important to uh, the states. Uh, right off the bat, it requires states to strategically align workforce development uh, programs to support uh, job seekers and employers. And so with that, there's uh, two areas. One, the new act calls for that single unified uh, strategic plan in which every state will have to develop and submit a four-year strategy for its core programs. Uh, the plans uh, will discuss uh, the state strategy to prepare an educated and skilled workforce that meet uh, the workforce need for 
of employers within their regions, both at the state and local uh, levels. Uh, the Act also calls for combined state plans. States can include other partners, such as jobs for veterans, state grant programs, unemployment insurance, uh, uh, TANF, uh, Perkins and, and the Perkins Career and Technology Education programs can all be included in a wider combined state plan. And so for, to, uh, for states to strategically align workforce development, it calls for a single unified strategic uh, plan. Uh, and I'll give you some deadlines in, as to when some of these plans are, are due uh, in the future. And it calls for a combined uh, state plan that brings in other key partners to be a part of your overall strategy and your planning to address workforce uh, development. Uh, the Act calls for more uh, accountability and transparency of programs there. And again, what does this mean? Under the core programs and other authorized programs are required to report on common performance uh, indicators. Uh, so as we work through this process, we're having much discussion as to how we align our performance indicators with education, uh, HHS, the other uh, core partners uh, that are participating uh, uh, as a part of uh, this act. Uh, a big one here, eligible training providers are required to provide data on performance outcomes for all students in training programs, which was also a part of the but is strongly emphasized in the, uh, in the uh, new act. As I mentioned earlier, uh, uh, the Act also streamlines and strengthens the uh, strategic uh, role of the workforce uh, development boards. And as you hear the language, is moving from the workforce investment boards to the workforce uh, development boards. And uh, with that, um, there's some new partners uh, that are uh, at the board, TANF now is a required member of the workforce uh, development boards at both the state and local levels. Uh, the apprenticeships is now a required partner at both the state and local uh, workforce uh, development uh, board. Again, uh, in terms of forcing regional collaborations, uh, states will be required to identify regions within their states and local areas uh, in regions will have uh, coordinated planning and service uh, delivery strategies. And so using uh, your local uh, labor, state and local uh, labor managed resources, uh, one should be able to look at those growth economic uh, development uh, opportunities and create strategies uh, to align the workforce system to meet uh, those needs. Uh, it, this, the Act all call, also calls for some improvements in the American uh, Job Center system. Uh, states uh, will, uh, will have to establish a criteria to certify those AJCs at least every three years to ensure continuous improvement, access to services, and including virtual services and integrated service delivery systems. Uh, in other words, uh, states will now have to establish a criteria of measurement for the American Job Centers, and those centers will be required to demonstrate uh, continuous improvement based on uh, the results and performance uh, outcomes. Uh, key uh, performance services uh, uh, at the um, a AJCs uh, will be the Wagner Pizer Employment Services is a required to co-locate uh, at the AJCs and as we've traveled around the country and conducted many of our listening sessions and uh, town hall meetings, 
Uh, we've gotten a lot of feedback on this particular issue uh, related to Wagner Pizer uh, Employment Services is now required to collate at the AJCs. Uh, TANF is, uh, is a new AJC required partner. Uh, states and local uh, areas will uh, will require be required to integrate intake, case management, and reporting systems, and including physical physical and management accountability uh, system. So uh, these areas, uh, particular um, reform initiatives within the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act have generated lots of uh, discussions as we've moved uh, around um, the country. Uh, some other key areas that states might uh, are probably interested in, uh, the act is designed to improve services to employers and uh, promote work-based uh, training. So states and local boards were responsible, or will be responsible for activities to meet workforce needs and local uh, regional employers. And there's as much emphasis around uh, utilizing proven work-based strategies, including incumbent worker training, registered apprenticeship, uh, on-the-job training, and customized training as, as well. Uh, there are increased reimbursement rates for employers for on-the-job and customized training. So there's a, a real need there to ensure that individuals are having an opportunity to either develop uh, some actual skills or demonstrate uh, their skills and abilities to that will lead and help them uh, succeed uh, in employment as well as meet the needs of employers. Okay, let's see here. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm on my time here. Now let's uh, move my, I think I hit many of the key points and if some of you may have questions and I'll respond to it, but for the sake of time, I'm going to move on to the transition to WIA, 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 WIOA and some of the key implement, implementation dates. In general, uh, the act takes effect on July 1, 2015. The first full program year of enactment, enactment um, Title IV amendments to the Rehabilitation Act takes effect immediately. The state unified plans and common performance accountability provisions take effect July 1, 2016. Uh, notices of proposed rulemaking, uh, which we're currently involved in, must be published by January 18, 2015, uh, no more than 180 days after the act. And the final rules must be published by January 22, 2016, uh, no more than 18 months after the act. Um, uh, I don't, I'm hoping that many of you, uh, the states have already received it. We sent out a Teagle as well as a question and answer uh, document earlier this week uh, specifying how states can spend no more than two percent spend no more than two percent of their PY 2014 allotment for transitional activities uh, of that amount um, not less than 50 percent is to be made available to local entities for those activities but we have published uh, additional uh, guidance uh, as well as a question and answer sheet to help states uh, better understand how to utilize those uh, that two percent of their um, 2014 um, allocations. Uh, for the for your technical assistance tools here, uh, I encourage everyone for additional information uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. You can go to www.d o l e t a the leader dot gov forward slash weoa w i o a uh, that's our resource page uh, for comments questions that you might have you can we have a dedicated weoa email you can send it to d o l dot weoa at d o l dot gov 
That's D O L dot WIOA, W I O A, at D O L dot gov. And uh, I'll be here to address uh, any other uh, questions or comments that you might have. Okay. Thank you, Robert, for your comprehensive overview of the law. We appreciate that. Let's turn to Lul, who will bring some perspectives from the U.S. Department of Education. Great. Thank you, Pam, for that introduction. And thank you to CSG for inviting me here today to talk about some of the significant changes in WIOA that affect the Adult Education and Family Literacy Act, or AFLA which provides foundation skills and English literacy instruction to nearly 1.8 million individuals each year. Um, thank you so much to Robert for the comprehensive overview of WIOA. One thing that I'd like to point out is the purpose of AFLA that is detailed in this new law. AFLA retains purposes that have been in place over 50 years of legislative history in adult education. The law acknowledges the broad role adult education and literacy plays in helping adults improve employment, self-sufficiency, but also in supporting the educational development of children. The law continues to place emphasis on the importance of high school completion for adults um, and recognizes that it's a, a primary importance to achieving some of the other broad purposes previously mentioned. But one thing that we see in WIOA is the expanded purpose of AFLA. AFLA recognizes that completion of high school is not an end in itself, but a means to further opportunity. It adds to the purpose of AFLA high school completion, the transition to post-secondary education through the use of career pathways. A new purpose statement in AFLA formalizes a role that adult education has played for decades relating to assisting immigrants and English language learners to learn to read, write, and speak English, adding mathematics to the scope of activities as well. It expands the focus of English language learning by adding civics-related uh, activities as a mandated program. Next slide, please. Now, I'd like to highlight five not notable changes to uh, Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act that affects adult education. And the first is uh, the alignment of federal investments to support job seekers and employers. Uh, as Robert mentioned, at the state level, WIOA establishes unified strategic planning across core programs, which include the Adult Dislocated Worker and Youth Programs and Wagner Pizer Employment Services administered by the Department of Labor as well as the adult education and literacy programs and vocational rehabilitation programs administered by the Department of Education. In addition to including a strategic vision and goal for preparing an educated and skilled workforce and for meeting the needs of employers, states must use the unified planning process to address their um, engaging community and technical colleges as partners in the workforce development. States are also required to submit title-specific elements, including for AFLA, that explain how they intend to align adult education content standards with state-adopted content standards, as well as assess the quality of adult education providers. As Robert mentioned, states also have the option of submitting a combined state plan in lieu of a unified state plan, which would allow them to include other federal programs, such as those funded through the Carl D. Perkins Career and Technical Education Improvement Act of 2006. We see this as a tremendous opportunity to really align all um, federal investments in education and workforce training programs to make sure that individuals with the greatest barriers to employment are able to receive comprehensive services and have access to career pathways. The second change that I'd like to highlight under WIOA is the fact that it establishes common performance measures and encourages uh, common data systems across the core program. Uh, this is related to the goal of improving alignment and coordination. Uh, we see that the core programs are held accountable to six uh, 
primary indicators of performance related to employment as well as educational outcomes such as credential attainment and measurable skill gain. The law places a strong emphasis on accountability and improvements in program outcomes to ensure that individuals have access to high quality services and opportunities. And we really see this as a, as a victory. The third point I'd like to highlight is the fact that we always strengthen the alignment between adult education, post-secondary education, and employers. WIOA recognizes that the core purpose of adult education is to prepare individuals with the skills and knowledge needed to succeed in post-secondary education in the workforce. It does this through promoting the integration of adult education with post-secondary occupational training, as well as promoting the development of career pathway systems by authorizing the use of funds for activities such as integrated education and, in, and training and workforce preparation activities. We all also reinforce the support to carry out integrated English literacy and civics education programs by codifying the authority to do this. Previously, under WIA, um, the authorization process provided funding for English literacy and civics education, but under WIO, it's now a required activity that states must use their funding for, and there is a specific set aside for integrated English literacy and civics education. This new program uh, retains the focus on English language proficiency and civics education instruction, but creates stronger ties to the workforce development system and employment. The fourth change I'd like to highlight is the fact that WIOA modifies the considerations states must make when issuing grants uh, to local entities. These include an increased emphasis on alignment of activities with regional needs identified in local plans required by Title I of the law. Um, and it also includes requiring um, states to take into consideration the coordination with education, training, employers, and social service providers to promote career pathways. Ultimately, the goal of these changes um, is that you know, the state competition process and the distribution of funds um, will strengthen the local adult education delivery system. The last change I'd like to highlight is uh, the increased support for corrections education. WIOA continues to support a range of education and job training activities for incarcerated individuals to promote successful reentry as well as reduce recidivism. And we see this um, in the increased uh, amount of funding that states can allocate for correctional ed. Previously under WIA, states could spend no more than 10%, but we now see that under WIOA, states are allowed to spend up to 20% of their adult education funds for corrections education. Now, this funding can go toward peer tutoring, reentry and transition services, integrated education and training, career pathways, as well as concurrent enrollment, and a number of other activities. Next slide, please. So as Robert mentioned, the Department of Education and Labor are working very closely to make sure that we can help with the successful implementation of this law. Um, we have been developing joint regulations that we will be issuing out in early winter of 2015. Um, and we are also providing resources, guidance, and information to our stakeholders to make sure that they feel well informed. Um, as you can see, there are a number of resources. I believe Robert highlighted uh, the US Department of Education website. But um, just note that we have two offices within the Department of Education that are supporting the implementation of this law, the um, Office of Career Technical and Adult Education, um, as well as OSERS, under which uh, Rehabilitative Services um, is. So uh, as you can see, we have a website and an email address. If you have any questions for Octane in particular as they pertain to adult education, please feel free to visit our website or email us at askafla, that's A-S-K-A-E-F-L-A, at ed.gov. Thank you so much for your time, and I look forward to answering any questions you have at the end of this webinar. Thank you all very much for your presentation. Now let's turn to Alicia, who will talk to us from the career and technical education perspective 
about some innovative programs currently existing in our state. Alicia? Thank you, Pam, and thank you for um, inviting me to be here to talk a little bit about um, what's going on on the ground related to um, the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act and, and really career pathways more broadly as states tackle um, the growing need to better integrate their education and job training and economic development sectors. Um, I wanted to just briefly mention a bit of background on ACTE in case you're not familiar with our organization. Um, we are the Association for Career and Technical Education. We're the largest um, nonprofit professional organization that represents the um, entire spectrum of the career technical education community. So our members make up um, everybody from a, you know, a middle school um, career exploration instructor to a community college president. Um, we include educators, administrators, guidance counselors, um, a number of business and industry partners across that spectrum of um, primarily school-based career technical education um, programs. Um, we they concentrate primarily on leadership and professional development uh, for our members, um, but are also involved in advocacy activities at the federal level and um, education activities around advocacy at the state level as well. Um, so if you'll go to the first slide, um, the many of the opportunities that we see in the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act have already been highlighted um, by the earliest, earlier panelists, so I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. But I think um, one of the things I really wanted to highlight was the focus on career pathways and the shift from a focus solely on, or primarily rather, on short-term training with the end goal of, of being one job to this idea of, of pathways for participants with multiple entry and exit points um, leading to credentials that might include you know, industry recognized certifications or certificates or even degree programs and, and stackable credentials that could be um, placed along that pathway. Um, we, we were very um, supportive of and excited by the the shift in rhetoric within uh, WIOA that focuses on pathways and program alignment and, and all of that leading to credentials and really a, a more lifelong learning approach to providing education and training to individuals across um, the workforce development community. Um, it, the, ACT also made a number of changes that will ease access to training um, for individuals and also um, make it easier for training programs to participate um, in the Workforce Investment and Opportunity Act and increase the flexibility that the Workforce Investment Boards have to design training programs that, that fit their local area, whether that's through contract-based training with education providers or um, some of the other innovative um, things that are going on already around the country, better integrating those into the system. Um, and we really think that this law is a product of the fact that the entire conversation around education and labor market connections is shifting at the federal level. Um, you know, just as we finish the reauthorization of WIOA, Congress is turning to the reauthorization of the, the Perkins Act, which funds um, career and technical education around the country. And one of the things we've really noticed um, in those reauthor reauthorization discussions is that um, we're talking about education as it relates to jobs and as it relates to economic development, which was a conversation that wasn't really um, being had the last time we reauthorized Perkins back in 2006. So there's definitely a growing recognition um, at the federal level that these connections need to take place and, and hopefully the uh, WIOA law will be an important step toward allowing that to happen um, in states and local communities. Um, at the same time, um, as you'll see on the next slide, there are a few challenges um, to implementation. Um, one of them is the, the continued separate systems 
that exist, um, you know, the education community and the, the workforce development community. And even though um, WIOA does a lot to align programs and common performance measures, um, there still exist at Avon States a number of initiatives already underway that happen in, in silos and that might be you know, things going on at the K-12 level uh, versus things going on more at the adult education level. Um, sometimes it's things going on in education um, itself versus in say economic development or workforce development and that bridge is one that continues to be a challenge. Um, as we think about career pathways, one of the challenges is even in the terminology itself. Many states are using career pathways um, to represent a 9 through 14 you know, program of study or pathway that's designed to be a seamless transition for students from secondary to post-secondary education. And that's where a lot of work is happening in states right now. Um, there's also work happening on the adult career pathway side where we look at things like you know, uh, adults re-entering the education system into adult basic ed and then transitioning into credit-bearing post-secondary programs and how can we design pathways um, that fit the needs of those individuals. And sometimes you have two different sets of activities going on at the state level um, related to those two um, different but very correlated and related sets of, of pathway activities. Um, there are uh, funding barriers still within the Workforce Investment and Opportunity Act, particularly as it relates to funding the infrastructure of the one-stop system and how, um, how those resources are going to be allocated and how partner programs can work together when all of the partner programs are suffering from an overall lack of resources moving forward. That's probably one of the biggest challenges um, that exist as we look at implementing this law is just the fact that funding has really stagnated um, for both WIA and Perkins and, and other federal investments in education and training over recent years as well as you know states are just coming off a, an economic recession where many states had to reduce resources in those areas as well and how can we um, meet the, the challenge of providing those appropriate funding levels um, hopefully at the federal level we'll start to see some improvements there um, and increase the capacity of the Workforce Investment and Opportunity Act to serve more individuals um, at the state and local level. Um, and then finally one challenge that we have been very attuned to lately are issues related to data and reporting. Um, how do we create the infrastructure um, and this is something that many states are struggling with to share data across their workforce and education systems to ensure that they have um, adequate and accurate information on student outcomes and student pathways through the system so that they can make the most informed programming decisions, but at the same time respect student privacy and um, ensure that data is kept confidential and all of those things that, that many states and local areas are grappling with moving forward. Um, I did want to briefly highlight, in addition to the Workforce Investment Act, um, a few other pieces of federal legislation um, on the next slide where really when we think about career pathways in a broader sense, many of these other pieces of legislation have just as much impact, um, if not more, than we will based on the number of individuals they touch um, in states and at the local level. Um, so the Perkins Career and Technical Education Act I mentioned is up for reauthorization this year. Um, just to kind of put things in perspective, um, we had 12 million students participate in CTE um, in school districts that received Perkins funding um, in recent years where um, you know only about 200,000 youth access training under WIOA in a, in a given program year. So it's a, a huge number of students get touched by Perkins and so that's a key opportunity related to career pathways. Um, the Higher Education Act has recently been identified as a piece that's very important um, because the financial aid that flows through the Higher Education Act is one of the, the largest investments in you know, education and training on a career pathway spectrum um, 
anywhere. Um, Pell Grants and student loans make up a huge investment in that type of education and training. The Elementary and Secondary Education Act is often overlooked in many of the career pathways discussions because historically it has focused on elementary um, education, primarily kind of that three through eight spectrum. But as more attention is placed on the idea of uh, you know, this accelerating the secondary, post-secondary connection and moving students into um, a position where they're college and career ready, um, ESEA is going to become more important in that conversation. And then, of course, there are many smaller grant programs. Um, often they're sector specific related to pathways. And one of the challenges that I know, um, you know state policymakers face is, is how to make all of these pieces fit together and work together. And that's something that we're very cognizant of at the federal level as we work on these various pieces of legislation is where can we put in um, linkages and ease administrative burdens across these laws to make things work together. Um, one of the other challenges at the federal level has been the slow reauthorization process. Um, at the very beginning, um, it was mentioned that we weren't sure we were ever going to get a new WIOA law because it hadn't been reauthorized since 1998, and many of the other pieces of federal legislation are also overdue um, for reauthorization. Um, none quite that far um, out of line, but um, all of these are, are up and under congressional consideration. And in absence of work at the federal level, many states have taken on um, the role of embracing career pathways and moving initiatives forward. And so we've seen a number of trends um, at the state level over the past couple of years. And probably the number one thing we've seen, ironically, is increased funding for career and technical education and career pathways initiatives. And that has come in a number of forms. Um, through bond initiatives, through targeted competitive grants in particular areas, through um, formula changes that reward states or school or reward school districts in particular states for things like industry certifications that their students earn or CTE dual enrollment credit that their students earn. Um, we've seen line items for equipment being a big um, deal in a number of states recently. So there, there definitely is a, a recognition at the state level that these initiatives take additional funding. And if, if the federal um, dollars are going to remain stagnant, then in, in many places it's been states that have picked up and, and funded pathways initiatives. Um, we've seen a number of governance changes. And many of these have served to bring in additional partners or solidify things like you know, councils at the state level that cross over education and workforce development and make it easier um, to develop pathways and to bridge that education and workforce um, gap. We've seen amended graduation requirements and secondary, post-secondary transition activities focused around things like you know, awarding additional academic credit for CTE courses or for industry certifications, endorsements on diplomas. Um, a lot of activity around dual enrollment and competency-based education that helps accelerate student learning from secondary to post-secondary education. Um, lots of focus on partnerships, um, whether that be pulling in economic development or looking at sector-based strategies or, um, again, some of the governance changes have focused on this as well. Um, creating partnerships between you know, secondary and post-secondary or education and economic development agencies to ensure that, that pathways represent um, the jobs and skills that students will be aspiring to in the future. Um, and then finally, industry certifications and data have been uh, key elements of many of the state initiatives. We've seen a, a huge increase in the number of states who are rewarding programs um, for credential attainment, whether that be certifications or for um, degree completion, as well as you know a focus on how to how to get better data and ensure that the data gets to the right people and so programmatic decisions can be made. Um, one of the, the things we've seen is that many of these state trends are happening across states and are being driven by larger initiatives like the Harvard Pathways to Prosperity Network has 
instituted a lot of cross-state activities. Um, and then we've also seen um, big initiatives spring up within states, driving a lot of these changes, like linked learning in California and the career academies movement in Florida um, that have driven larger conversations outside just the, the K-12 sphere. However, one of the drawbacks to many of the things that we've seen is that they are primarily happening on the education side. Um, they are pulling in workforce development partners or economic development partners, um, but they're still largely focused on um, kind of that that K-12 directly into post-secondary pathway is where we've seen the largest focus of state legislation in recent years. And so. Um, Additional focus is definitely needed on uh, broader pathway systems and how to create um, adult pathways or pathways for students who might not have just exited from high school, who might be coming back into the education system you know, at some later point. On the next slide, I have just a sample of some of the, the state programs that have been initiated in recent years. And they kind of illustrate this. Um, you know, the CAPE Act in Florida, the Career Pathways Trust in California, and Louisiana's Jumpstart program all focus on that secondary, post-secondary transition. They, they approach it in different ways, um, looking at either industry certifications or dual enrollment credit or uh, partnerships between entities to ensure um, that those pathways are um, aligned with regional economic development priorities. And in, in all of those cases, businesses and economic development entities and the workforce development training providers were key players in developing this legislation, but it was still centered at the kind of the education or the, the K-12 system. And so as we look at implementing WIOA, how to blend the, these initiatives that are already going on um, with the things that are going to be happening under that new piece of federal legislation will definitely be a challenge. Um, I'm going to stop there to make sure we have a few minutes left for questions. Um, we do have a report um, that we can make available. It's, it's on our website and easy to find on all of the state legislation that was passed in 2013 related to career and technical education and career pathways. And we're um, in the process of putting one together for 2014 as well. Um, so if anybody um, has trouble finding that and, and wants more information, you can feel free to contact us at any time. Thank you, Alicia, very, very much. And I certainly appreciate the um, state legislative example. It's very good for our members. I do have one question that came from a listener, and I'll open this up to all of our panelists today. This is needed. However, training all people, including those who need education as well as job training, when the American Job Centers by mandate have to take in everyone, is expensive. That means money as well as resources. Career training rather than job training is universally accepted as necessary, but how? But it's far more expensive. How can states pay for these needed training programs? I'll toss that to all three of our speakers. This is. This is Alicia. I'll jump in quickly. I think, um, as I identified, that is one of the biggest challenges: is how to to fund these activities, both the the systems building and infrastructure support that needs to be in place to to ensure all of the systems work together. Um, but then also just the actual training. Um, we know it 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 costs a great deal to provide some of the kind of high-tech, high-demand programs that are necessary to prepare people for the jobs that are available now, you know, all of the healthcare IT and nanotechnology and advanced manufacturing programs require a great deal of resources. Um, some of the strategies that we've seen be very successful have been things like state bond initiatives. Um, incentives for business and industry to partner with programs, um, whether that be through uh, you know, tax credits or uh, some form of uh, tax relief in states where business and industry have come to the table. Um, I think 
meshing funding streams together from many of these different pieces of legislation and looking outside the traditional um, programs that might, you know, that Perkins is often used to provide uh, money for actual training programs at the post-secondary level, but looking outside of that and, and using some of the innovative um, programs included in WIOA like contract training or um, things like that might be a step in the right direction. But it's definitely a challenge that many states are grappling with. Just or Lowell, any other comments? Yeah, I was going to add, just to piggyback off of that, I mean, um, the folks at the Department of Education, and I'm sure the folks at the Department of Labor as well, really um, believe in the importance of direct service and um, delivery to individuals. And so we definitely um, think that it's important to maintain investment in programs that are serving individuals who need them most. Um, and definitely recognize their opportunities to explore some innovative ways to kind of contribute to the um, one-stop infrastructure costs. And um, so we definitely plan on issuing guidance and providing technical assistance to make sure that local areas and states um, have the support that they need to make sure that these costs are covered. Um, uh, this is Robert, and I would want to add to that that I think as we look at uh, some of the job-driven initiatives, particularly around how we better leverage resources, uh, integrated funding, if you will, blended funding, and look at ways that uh, additional fundings uh, around workforce development can be leveraged uh, with funds within the public workforce systems to enhance uh, training. Uh, for instance, we've been, uh, we're currently engaged in having a lot of discussion with the U.S. Department of Agriculture around their SNAP employment and training programs to see how we can leverage dollars to enhance um, training for individuals that are out there in the uh, SNAP in the public workforce system. So I just think we, we probably have to think a little differently, uh, use some creativities, and look at ways that we can take advantage of some of the uh, new uh, requirements on the WIOA to uh, better utilize our resources and do some things a bit different than we have in the past. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, we're about out of time this morning. We do have additional questions, and I know our speakers would be um, pleased to speak with you via email after this eAcademy series. Senator Norris, let me turn back to you for final thoughts and comments before we close this morning. Boy, time really flies, doesn't it? Thank you, Pam, and thanks to all of you for participating in our webinar today. There will be more in the future. I encourage you all to visit our website at the Council of State Government, csg.org, and you can either go to our State Pathways to Prosperity link, which you will see there, the little man with the hard hat and the diploma, or visit our Knowledge Center. Um, there's a wealth of information there, and I encourage you to visit and interact with us. Pam, panelists, uh, listeners, thank you all very much for participating, and we'll hope to do this again soon. Thank you. Great.